Let's begin with a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful privilege of prayer, our ability to come before you, stand in your presence, and obtain grace in the time of our need. Thank you, Lord, for our prayers are heard. Thank you that we can pray and through prayer change many things in our life and in our world. We thank you for this privilege and I pray that those who participate in it, coming here as well as from home, will be blessed today immensely through this experience. Teach us how to pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn with me again to Psalm 71. We're still in Psalm 71. We looked at a little Psalm 71 a little bit, and we're going to continue today. If you remember Psalm 71, I said, is a psalm of, for old age. So, but don't think that if you're not old, that this psalm is not for you because you will one day get old. <laughs> Believe me, I was young <laughs> and uh, it doesn't take very long to become old. Very soon, you'll be old also. So it will apply to all of us. And also, we all deal with older people, you know. So I hope that this psalm helps us to understand them more and uh, to pray for them more and to know about their problems, and their heart, and what's going on. All of these things are very important as a church. We pray for, sometimes pray for our children, sometimes we pray for our young people, uh, and all these things, you know. These are different uh, kinds of people that are there. They have their own needs, you know, and their own, they have their own problems. And so we need to be very sensitive about that, and only by talking about it can we become very sensitive about it. Now, this is a psalm for old age. How do we say that? Look at Psalm 71, verse 9. Do not cast me away when I'm old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone, for my enemies speak against me, and those who wait to kill me conspire together, and so on. Okay? And um, I think, again, it comes uh, uh, later on also. Again, he mentions uh, in verse 17, he says, since my youth, God, you have taught me, and so on. And when the, in verse 18, he says, even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, O God. So there is the reference to old age. I believe the psalmist in his old age, the psalmist David, the psalmist is David, and uh, we talked about how he is the psalmist here last week. And uh, he lived to be a grand old man and lived very, uh, lived in a wonderful way, lived as a wealthy man and an honorable man, died as a wealthy and honorable person, the Bible says. After all his faults and sins and all of those things, still his end was very great, a wonderful end he had. And in his old age, he's praying. And that's what we talked about last week. And we talked about old age problems. We mentioned particularly three problems. Weakness, you know, so that there is a loss of the strength and abilities that were there before. It's diminished now because of old age. Secondly, sometimes there's continuation of troubles, uh, particularly enemies and particularly the problems that uh, we feel vexed with, you know. Sometimes at, in old age, people don't want to deal with problems with children and their families and their marriage and all of these things, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a vexing thing, you know, because your mind is not so alert and your body is not willing to cooperate and you're just old and tired and you don't want to deal with all their problems also. You're dealing with your problems, that's more than enough for you. And thirdly, uh, the problem of being alone and having no one to help. These three problems are old age problems that are common to everyone. And you can come up with a lot more also. But these are three most common problems. Physical weakness 
and uh, troubles persisting even in old age. Troubles don't leave you just because you're old. Troubles sometimes follow and it seems to be lasting all through life sometimes. So that is a vexing thing. And thirdly, the fact that you're alone and you feel lonely, uh, especially when your spouse passes away or when your children are far away and uh, they're, they're not uh, very near you to see to you and all that. Uh, this is a problem. It's a problem that particularly people in our country, uh, they experience a lot. All right. Now, we prayed for people of that kind, right? We prayed for people who are going through the old age problems. Let's take just a minute to pray for them again today. You know, pray for people that feel physical weakness, that feel uh, like they're facing problems that they are not able to uh, tackle very much at their old age and people that are feeling lonely particularly, you know. Let's pray for people, uphold them in prayer so that God will strengthen them, so that their loneliness, you know, will be dealt with, that they will feel, they'll never feel that they are lonely, that they'll feel God's presence with them. They'll feel the comfort and the strength and find uh, satisfaction through very many other things that are available. Sometimes it's possible uh, to get rid of loneliness in so many ways. And I hope that they'll find it and let's pray for it. Father God, we pray for our elderly people very specially, oh God. People that are getting old and that are facing old age and, and it itself is a problem to them, oh God, that they're vexed with their inability to deal with problems. They're physically weak, their strength is diminishing and uh, they're alone and they feel lonely. We pray and uphold such people very specially, O oh God. People that are in, especially in old people's homes, uh, taken care of uh, by uh, uh, others. And uh, then there are people that are living by themselves, alone, uh, with nobody to care for them. Uh, people with children far away, but they are living by themselves here. Uh, Father, we uphold these people to you, Lord. I pray that you will specially uh, help them to feel your presence in a very special way and your strength and your joy and your peace. I pray that you will help them to deal with their loneliness and, and the fact of this old age and diminishing strength <clears throat> and all of these things, oh God. I pray that you will be their strength and their health and their everything, oh Father, <clears throat> that at this age, you're, like your word says, that your youth will be renewed like eagles. I pray that, that these people will feel a renewal of strength, new strength, supernatural strength, uh, to be able to uh, cope with all of these things, O oh God, that their youth will be renewed and they'll be strengthened. Their strength will become like the eagles, which eagle which renews its strength, O oh God. Praise you, Jesus. Pray for people that are facing problems, that are dealing with problems with their children, their families, and so on. Sometimes the failure of the children to have a good successful marriage and, and successful career and all of those things, and, and the burden falls on these older people. We pray for these older people that are dealing with all of these troubles in their old age, oh Father. I pray that you'll give them the wisdom and the strength and help them to rely on you for your strength, oh Father. Show them the way, oh Father. Help them to be a, be a, a strength to their children at this age, oh God, with all their experience and wisdom and everything that they have. I pray that they will be, they'll be able to contribute to the success of their children, to uplift them, to strengthen them, to counsel them, and to talk to them and to be of help to them, O oh Father. I pray that you will enable them to fulfill their role in that old age, O oh Father. Be with them and strengthen them in a very special way, O oh Father. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for all the elderly people that are there in our church. I pray that you'll specially minister to them these days. Strengthen them. Let them feel the effect of our prayer in their homes and wherever they are, O oh Father. Let them be touched by your power in the midst of the feelings of their infirmity. May they feel the power of God, touch them, strengthen them. And I pray that there'll be an upliftment that happens in their heart, in their attitudes, 
in their minds, oh God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, in Psalm 71, if you look at uh, verses 9, 10, and 11 are the verses that refer to the old age problems. Let me just read them and then we'll go on. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. There's the first problem of physical strength diminishing. Strength fails, right? And then 10, for my enemies speak against me and those who wait to kill me conspire together. David had a lot of enemies and enemies seem to have never left him. Even in his old age, he feels like they're still conspiring against him and uh, they're up against him as a king. And uh, sometimes we are not kings and so we don't have that problem that much, but we still do have life's problems persisting uh, through old age. And he says, you know, Lord, look at my problem. And he's asking for God's help. Then he says in verse 11, they say God has forsaken him, pursue him and seize him for no one will rescue him. Here it talks about the loneliness. There is no one to help him. There is no one with him. And that becomes an advantage for the enemies. So those are the three problems we talked about. All right. Now, the next thing we looked at is verse 5 to 7. Uh, we had a couple of weeks gap, so I, I'm just catching up on those things. Verse 5 to 7 is the next thing that we looked at. In verse 5 to 7, he remembers his past. And it's a wonderful remembrance of the past, you know. The, in the old age, you'll see people reminiscing about their past experiences, their childhood days, and how they were, where they were born, and their parents, and their siblings, and so on. So he remembers his past. Look at what he says in verse 5. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. I have become a sign to many. You are my strong refuge. All right. He says, you have been my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. So he realizes in his old age that God has had a hand upon him and his eyes were upon him, watching over him and helping him, even since the time that he was in his mother's womb. What a great comfort that should be to think of all the years that have gone by and you realize more than ever that even when you were formed in your mother's womb, that God had his hand upon you. That's a wonderful thing to remember. And he says, I've become a sign to many. And I said that it can be taken in two ways. A sign points to something, right? And it can point to something good as well as bad. So a sign to many in David's case may mean something good because he was a shepherd boy who became a king. So he is, in some translations you will read, he's a wonder to many. People look at him and they see the wonder of God's grace. They see what a man can become from the dust heaps to sitting as a king over a great nation and having victories on every side. Uh, from being nothing to being a very grand old man and, and a great man with great power and wealth and all of that. So he's a wonder. People look at him and they wonder in a positive sense that he was nothing, now he is at his grand old age, he's become such a great man. That is one thing. It can also be something negative in the sense that people will always remember David for his faults and his sins, right? The sin with Bathsheba, the murder that he committed, the conspiracy behind that murder and all of that. Uh, people sometimes never forget. God forgives and forgets, but people will never forget. And people are probably talking about it. And uh, they are probably drawing many lessons from it. Look at him, look at all that stuff that he did. and uh, Look at the mess that he made of his life. And I'm sure uh, a lot of people were talking and had a lot to comment about his failures and so on. And, uh, but I think in the midst of it all, God's grace will be glorified because people will see that even though he failed, God never failed. God was with him, God forgave him, God, uh, restored him 
and uh, God honored him. Uh, he's a human being, you know, uh, and 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 he has failed many times, but God never fails. God loved him. He said he's a man after his own heart. God really liked David. So even when they look at look at him negatively, even the sins that he had committed, as well as the problems that he went through, his own son tried to usurp uh, him to the throne tried to throw him out and he had to go on the run. One time he fled from Saul before he became king. Another time after he became king, he fled from his own son Absalom for his life. He had to flee. His own son chasing him, trying to kill him and gathering a group against him. All of these things he went through. So when it says that he is a sign and a wonder Literally, he's a sign and a wonder both ways, positively and negatively. You can look at the many wonderful things that has happened to this man. You can look at the very many troubles that he had gone through and how that he crossed all those mountains and he still made it. Amen? That's why the Bible says, remember the end of Job. Job is a man that suffered a lot. It doesn't say remember the beginning because the beginning is full of problems. End was grand, eh? end was grand. And even in Hebrews chapter 13, verse five to eight, if you read, it says uh, that we must, uh, we must remember those that taught us the word of God and how they ended their life, how their life ended, we must remember. Eh? It says, uh, remember those who rule over you, 13.7, Hebrews 13.7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome or the end of their conduct or the end of their life. How they ended their life, look at that. So here is David. He has known God from his youth. So he remembers how God has been with him. And uh, he now realizes that uh, he has become a wonder and a sign before people. And uh, so he remembers God with gratitude. Uh, he remembers God's faithfulness. Uh, he has gone through life's trials, blessings, perils and deliverances. And uh, he has come through it all. Uh, he is certainly a wonder and a sign in this sense. And uh, it's wonderful to read about all that. All right. Now let's look at something that we have not looked at last week. That's verse 17 and 18. I told you the first few verses are exact repetition from Psalm 31. So we didn't deal with it. Okay. First three verses particularly. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me, save me. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me for you are my rock and my fortress. All right, these three verses are exactly the repetition of Psalm 31 verses one to three. So we didn't deal with it. But now let's go to verse 17. Verse 17, all right. Now he's looking ahead. He's looked to the past and realized that even from his birth, God has known him. Even when he was formed in his mother's womb, God has known him. From his youth, he has known him. And God has always been good to him. And he remembers the goodness of God. And uh, now he looks to the future, the next generation in verse 17 and 18. Look at those wonderful verses. Since my youth, God, you have taught me and to this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, you my, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Now in his old age, he has a desire. He has a desire to do something here. He remembers that God has been his help and he has taught him many things since his youth. And uh, he says, till this day I declare your marvelous deeds. And when I'm old and gray, don't forsake me, he says, till I declare your power to the next generation. 
I really like that. He wants to tell the next generation the goodness of God. He wants to tell the next, pass the news on to the next generation of how God has been faithful, how God has been good. You know, some people in their old age only look back to the past and are often quite unhappy as they do. Eh? They think of what they've had uh, and lost or what they wish they could have had and never were able to accomplish or do. The present does not mean much to them except as a basis for complaining eh? about their multiplying aches and pains and they're even afraid to look forward. They don't want to think about the future. They say, what future? I don't have a future. That's a very negative attitude that an old person can sometimes entertain. We should not. <laughs> when you become old, you should remember, you should not become negative. You should look back and count on the blessings of God. That's one thing you need to do. You know, not complain all the time about what you've not been able to do, what you could not accomplish, what was not there, what you failed, and your failures and all of those things. Psalmist is not doing it. He has a lot of things to complain about because he has done a lot of wrong things and he can go over all of those things, but he doesn't. But he thinks about the marvelous deeds that God had accomplished through him. He still remembers in his mind the fight that he had with Goliath, the great victory that God gave him. Eh? And uh, he says, oh Lord, don't forsake me when I'm old because I want to tell the next generation uh, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Uh, he wants to pass on the good things that God has done. Uh, he doesn't want to just complain to the young people and tell them all that he missed and everything, that every failure of his life and all that. He wants to tell the young people about the great mighty deeds of God. So the old people have a great heritage, you know, especially if they're godly people, people who know God, they have something to say to the young people. Eh? They have something to say to the young people. And one man said that the Christian church is always one generation away from extinction. Extinction means completely being wiped out. He meant that each generation has the responsibility of passing the Christian doctrine to the next generation. If you don't pass it on, it will perish in your generation. That's one great responsibility you and I have as we age in this world. Because we've gone through life, we've gone through one or two generations, and we have something to say to the young people. We have something to contribute to the young people. I, in our church, I sometimes, when I go up and down between the services, I see hundreds and hundreds of kids, you know, going up and down. And what a wonderful, sometimes I used to think, it would be nice to go there and teach, <laughs> talk to those kids, you know. Uh, I would love to do that, you know, to, to those little kids of all ages, you know. Talk to them and tell them about what God has done, you know. You can complain if you want, but I tell you, don't waste your time complaining. Recount the blessings of God, the wonderful things that God has done. Go over them to your children. Talk to them. Talk to the next generation. Influence the younger people that you see. You see, <clears throat> the older people have a special and peculiar ability to teach the young. That's why even Paul tells the older women to teach the younger women, you know. At one point, he says, that the younger women be taken under the uh, tutelage of the older women and let them be trained and let them be, let them get close to some of the younger people. You know, the older people, I think, should get close to some of the younger people and talk to them about life and about everything, anything, any issue, anything. Uh, it's very important uh, to converse with them, know their mind, know their heart. And, and, and maybe when you open up to them, when you give them an opportunity, I think some of these young kids will, will, will open themselves to you, you know, 
to older people, ask you for ideas, ask you for counsel. Uh, you know, in, in our country, sometimes we see some of these young people commit suicide because they couldn't study properly, they fail in their exams, and sometimes they're having big struggle with their studies, and sometimes there's a big problem they have with their home life, with parents sometimes, and all of that. And uh, the old, older people, I say, to the older people of this church, I say that you have a marvelous opportunity to befriend some of the young people and to be of help to them in any way and every way possible, you know. Uh, because there is an opportunity for you to talk to them, encourage them, guide them, and, and give them some wise advice concerning some things. You know, sometimes we just get on them only when they do something wrong. <laughs> and all the time when they're uh, not doing anything wrong or right, we just don't reach out to them sometimes, I think. I think we need to reach out to them and minister to them. That's the way the ministry should go on in the church. You know, reach out to the younger people and take them under your wings and, and help them out, you know, in whatever way you can. Just being a friend to them and, and giving some good advice and showing them the way. In so many ways, we can be helpful. I always find as a pastor, I always find just maybe because I'm a pastor, they seek me. I think because, because also I'm older, I think. A lot of younger people seek me out and want to talk to me and want to find out some things. And, and they're very interested, you know, uh, in finding out what I think about certain things and so on. It's a wonderful opportunity to minister to them. We're planning to have some youth ministry here. During that time, we want to use some of the older people, you know, uh, to kind of get in there and get some of the young people under them and 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 help them uh, and minister to them. All right. So just because the older person has lived with God longer, you know, and has seen more of God's faithfulness, God's goodness over more years of their life, you know, than the younger people, I think they know much more. And uh, they're well equipped to help the young people. And that is why there is a natural bond between elderly and the children. In our country, it's very convenient because younger people respect generally the older people in our culture. And in some countries, it's not so. But in our countries, older people are respected. So it's a wonderful opportunity. That's why we have older people teaching the younger people in the children's church, you know. Uh, children's res children respect and they listen to older people. And it's a wonderful opportunity to share with them good things and show them the way. All right. So let's uh, stop and pray now. Everyone should have a vision about the next generation, right? Everyone should have a vision about the next generation. We should convey our experiences with God. We should tell the young people how God has been faithful and good. We should encourage young people in the Lord. We should tell young people some of the problems that we've gone through and have come out, how we came out and all. So it will be an encouragement to them because they'll go through some problems and they'll remember this especially when they go through problems. It's wonderful to minister to them, telling them about what you've gone through and how you've survived and, and flourished in the midst of all of them. These are things that we meet in life, you know. <laughs> For one simple, silly thing that happened in life, one girl was crying like anything, you know, profusely. <laughs> I said to her, look, you're just starting out. You're going to face a lot of problems. <laughs> What are you going to do? Sit and cry every time you have a problem? Eh? And I shared with her how life will bring all kinds of problems and, uh, and you should be able to stand up to the problems and with God's help and with God's wisdom deal with those problems and go on in spite of the problems and how to spend the days when you're going through that problem, that emotional problem, that 
mental anguish and all that. How to pass those days very carefully without getting dejected, without giving up hope. How to come out through that time. How to hold your breath until you make it out of there, you know. And I think it will help them. Let's, uh, let's pray. Let's, let's pray for the next generation. Let's pray for the older people to have a vision for the next generation so that they'll be able to minister to the younger people. Father God, we pray for our next generation. Oh, the young people, the precious lives of these young people that are there in our Sunday schools, that are there in our youth, among the youth, these young people that are just out of school, just in college, and the young people that are just in, in the school still, in nursery school onwards, uh, the, the, and their lives. Oh, Father, we, we, we pray that you will give us a great vision about them, oh, Father, to help them, to minister to them, to think about them, to be concerned about them, oh, Father, that the older people will make it a mission in their life to... Take a few young people at least and aim at helping them and befriending them and ministering to them in a powerful way. Oh, being a people of God, having known God for such a long time and having gone through life's troubles and experiences, having gone through the various problems, I pray, Lord, that we will use all our experience and uh, knowledge that you have given to us to help others, to minister to others, oh, Father. Oh, I pray that, that a lot of older people will occupy themselves instead of feeling bored in their old age. Let them occupy themselves by ministering to other people. Even on just phone or just meeting in person, meeting in church or meeting under some circumstance or the other. Being a great influence and a model before them and inspiring them and encouraging them bringing courage to them and telling them the true stories of life that they've gone through and telling them mainly about the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Oh, pray! I pray, Lord, that you will help people to minister in a wonderful way to young people, that people will be helped, that there will be a bonding between the older and the younger people in the coming days, oh, Father that people will reach out to the younger people like never before and minister to them, strengthen them, and be a positive influence in their lives, O oh God. A positive influence. Positive influence, O oh God. Positive, good influence. Oh, so that the young people will tomorrow say, I learnt it from that man. I learnt it from that person that helped me to understand these things. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that, like David, that we will declare your power to the next generation uh, about your might, about your mighty deeds, your mighty works, how you've helped us, how you've been with us, how you never failed us, how you've seen us through all the problems. I pray that you will help us to declare it to our next generation. Because our next generation are the ones that are going to live in the future, that are going to carry it on to the next generation that comes after them. I pray that you'll help us to leave a rich message to them. Oh, the message of God's love and God's grace and God's power to them, oh Father. The words that we speak may it ring in their ears for a long time to come. May they remember till their old age what we have been able to say to them, O oh Father. O oh Father, I pray that the older people among God's people will have an impact upon the next generation. The next generation. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. One of the things that you can do as an older person is to pray for younger people. Pray. When you pray, you'll get a desire to minister to them. When you remember to pray for the young people that you know, you will want to minister to them. You will want to talk to them. You will be concerned about them. Prayer is something, it's like this, you know, when you pray for missions and missionary work and all that, then you'll want to help them also, you know. That's the way it happens. Uh, prayer is a good thing to start with. When you pray, you will automatically reach out to them. 
and minister to them. You know, God always thinks in terms of future generations. That's why he never, when he blessed Abraham, he didn't say, I'll bless you. He said, this blessing is for you, for your children, eh? and for children's children. Even when God spoke about pouring out his spirit in the last days, he said, upon you and your children. God is looking at the generations to come. When he spoke to jo through Joel the prophet, he was speaking about all of us, how he will pour out his spirit upon the young people and so on. So God is a great visionary. He sees a future. He sees the young people going on into the future, carrying on the legacy, the message of the gospel and so on. So we need to think about young people and minister to young people instead of just thinking about how we are getting old and, 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 and becoming uh, weak and this and that, you know. No, we're, we're strong in so many areas. <laughs> we may be weak physically, but we are strong in so many other areas. We're strong in wisdom and, and knowledge. And we're, we know a lot, a lot more than these young people. Uh, we are strong in the Lord, you know, because we've seen a lot. And uh, uh, we know we don't waver so much like we used to when we were young, you know, because we know for sure now <laughs> all these problems are not going to drown us, you know. So we walk more surely, sure-footed we are. So we can help other people. So you are strong in so many ways. Instead of thinking about how you're getting old, think about how you're strong, in what areas you're strong and minister to people who are young but weak in some areas. They may be strong physically, but they are weak in some areas. Mentally, emotionally, they are weak. That's why for a little trouble they start crying and worrying. And so that's why they give up hope with just a little trouble like failing a subject or failing in, a, in an attempt at some kind of exam or something like that you know, because they're weak, emotionally and mentally, they're weak, and you have the mental and emotional strength to help them. So think about it like that. Always think positively, amen? <laughs> Don't be always talking about, I'm old and, you know. No, 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 You're, being old is good in some ways. <laughs> you know, it's being, it's really good in some ways. All right. So let's uh, go on a little bit more. The next one is Psalm uh, 71, 19 onwards. 19 onwards. 19 to 24. Now, he went through the past, right? He looked at his past, and that was like verse um, 7 uh, onwards, right? Or where was that? That was like uh, in verse 5 onwards, right? Verse 5 to 7, he looked at his past. And then he looks at his future in verse 17 and 18. He wants to leave something to the next generation. He says, Lord, be with me, strengthen me, don't forsake me till I convey what I want to convey to the next generation. Huh? That's a wonderful prayer. You need to pray that prayer so that God will give you years and strength and ability to reach out to others and convey what you need to convey to them. And now let's go to, go to verse 19. This is the psalmist looking at the present. We look, he looked at the past, remembered how God has been with him from the mother's womb. He looked at the future, future generation. He wants to give something to them before it's all over and he wants God to be with him and strengthen him so that he may leave some rich legacy with the younger people who are going on to the next generation. So he's thinking about the future. Now, verse 19 to 24 is that where he's thinking about the present. Look at that. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You've done great things. Who is like you, God? Though you have made me see troubles many and bitter, you will restore my life again. You will increase my honor and comfort me once more. I will praise you with harp, 
for your faithfulness, my God. I will sing praise to you with the lyre. Holy One of Israel, my lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you. I whom you have delivered, my tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. For those who wanted to harm me have been put to shame and confusion. So he has looked at his past to remind himself of God's faithfulness and power. He looked at his future to remind himself of the work yet to be done, that is the work among the young people, to convey the good things to the younger generation. Then having done both these things, he turns to the present and begins to do exactly what he's been talking about. He bears witness to God now. He's talking about God's faithfulness and God's righteousness now. First he talks about God's righteousness, then, then his faithfulness. What do we mean by God's righteousness? Righteousness is a word that is used in different ways in the Bible. Now, one of the popular ways in which it is used is the righteousness that God gives to us, right? We talk about it, how we are sinners and our best is still filthy rags before God. It's not acceptable. Therefore, he gives us his righteousness. That's what happened on the cross. He took our sin and his righteousness comes to us. That's one kind of way the word righteousness is often used in the New Testament. But there is another kind of way, oftentimes the word righteousness is used in the Old Testament, and that is about how God is always right. How God is always right. And there is no fault in him. No one can find any mistake or fault in him. He's always right. In his judgment, he's always right. Tuesday nights we've been dealing with Romans and I've been talking about how God's judgments are always right. <laughs> when you know that, when you know that God can never make a mistake, then all the questions about this and that in the Bible flies away, you know. <laughs> a lot of people have trouble accepting how God burnt up Sodom and Gomorrah. How can God do that, they say. <laughs> well, if God did that, he, was, he must have been right because he never does anything wrong. Maybe you don't understand the details. You don't understand how right it is, how it is well justified. But that's your problem. It's not God's problem. God is never wrong. Once you understand the doctrine of righteousness, that God is a righteous God, is always right, then there's no question. Some people have a problem with the Noah's flood, you know. How can God do that? Destroy the whole world, except one family. Well, people just, you know, they just think on top of their head, you know, without going any, any, any deeper than that. Just out of the top of their head, they think. Say, oh, I can't imagine a God doing like that. How horrible it is to kill everybody like that. <laughs> well, you need to read the Bible right. If you look at it, then you will feel, then you will know that God is righteous. How patient God has been. Even when Noah was building that uh, ark, how long God waited. There was a man born before the flood came. His name was Methuselah. He lived for more than 900 years, 969 years, I think. And he is the longest living person in the Bible. His name meant when he died, it will come. What will come? The flood will come. <laughs> For a long time, people have been very wicked. They've been very, you know, no one will tolerate such wickedness. God looked at the earth and men and was sorry that he ever made them. That's the way the Bible says in chapter 5 and 6 of Genesis. You read in chapter 6 particularly, God says that he was, he repented that he ever made mankind. That's the way it is. That means he was sorry. That's how wicked they've become. That's how evil they've become. Man's heart was continually evil, the Bible says. Earth was filled with such wickedness that if it was allowed to go on, there would not be one, even one person left. Even Noah and his family would have been gone into that wickedness. God had to start all over again. 
Now, people don't think about all of these things. It's like a doctor removing an arm to save the person. Do you know, when people get their arms or legs removed, they pay the doctor lakhs to get it removed. They say, please remove it, because if they don't remove it, they'll die. It's a matter of whether you want to live or you want to save your arm. <laughs> they say, let my arm go or my leg go, I want to live. Here is the money. Two, three lakhs if it costs, I'm ready to pay. Remove it, they say. It was such an operation that God did. To save mankind, God had to do that. But you have to, you have to understand God, that he is righteous. He's always right. <laughs> that way, the word righteousness is used. A lot of times in the Old Testament, it is used that way. That God is right, he is just. He never does anything wrong. It may look to you like wrong. It may look to you like horrible. How can God ever do that? But you will learn very soon when you read the Bible and understand it, that you will never think about God as unrighteous because you know one thing, that God is righteous. You may see something horrible happen and you may want to question God's goodness. Never question it. When you reach a point in understanding Bible doctrine, Bible teaching, you'll come to a place where you know that whatever God does, even if I don't understand how right it is, it may look to me like wrong. It has to be right because God did it. In some way, it has to be right. People even question the cross. They say, how can God, this good God, put his son on the cross and kill him there? He delivered him up for us all, Paul says. How can God kill Jesus, his own son? Who would want a God who kills his own son? <laughs> this is the way they argue against God. That's why they don't want to believe in the substitutionary sacrifice, that Jesus became a sacrifice for us. They don't want to believe. But that idea of sacrifice is tribal idea of God, they say. Not acceptable to people because that presents God in a bad light, they say. Well, but if you understand what was happening, you'll see only how great God's love is, you know. That in order to save you and to forgive you and to bring you and make you his child, he was ready to allow his son to suffer and die and be in the grave for three days and he raised him up. God who actually delivered him up to die, did not let him die and be dead. He raised him up on the third day, you should not forget it. <laughs> if, if you think that God killed him, God killed him means then you'll think he's wrong. Look at the glorious way in which he raised him. The Bible says he humbled himself even to the death on the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name above every name so that Everything in heaven and on earth and under the earth is subject to that name. That every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. When you see that, you say, hey, God is so good. <laughs> That's why the son also, when he died, he closed his eyes saying, Lord, I give my spirit to, into your hands. He trusted the Father that he will not let him perish in the grave. Psalmist prophesied in 16th Psalm, he said, you will not let the Holy One see corruption. That means you will not let my body go dust to dust. You will not leave me that long. You will raise me up. He believed it. He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Referring to his body, his death, his resurrection in three days. Jesus knew that God is good. Jesus trusted God completely. He didn't think of God as this terrible father who sent him to die. No, no, no. Jesus knew that God will not let him down. That God will exalt him more than ever. And give him a name above every name. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus knew that great glory was coming to him. That's why he obeyed him willingly. See, when you understand this, you understand God is righteous. <laughs> God is righteous. 
That's why Paul says he is not only righteous and he makes the sinners righteous. <laughs> he is not a, it's not that he is righteous, that he also is a God who makes the sinners righteous. He is a good God. This thing about God being good must go deep in our hearts. It must settle every question. It must go in in such a way that we, we are past that thing of questioning God's actions. We know that if God does something, it is always right. And you believe that God is good like that, then even when you give your life for him, like Jesus, if you had to give your life for him, you will be ready to do that. That's how apostles died when they were killed for the gospel's sake. They believed that he is Lord. That he, they believed that there is a judgment. They believed that there is a resurrection. They believed there is a life after this death. They believed it totally. They believed that God is good. They didn't die saying, oh God, you let us down. Look at this, what's happening to us? No. They totally believed God. <laughs> Amen. God is righteous. Everybody say God is righteous. He's always right. Always just. Never wrong. Never wrong. And God is always faithful. That's the second thing he talks about. God is always faithful. And he says that he's going to really praise God for his faithfulness. Sing praise to him because of his faithfulness. Shout for joy because God is faithful and righteous. He says, my tongue will tell you, tell of your righteous acts all day long. I think when you praise and worship God, you should spend time praising and worshiping God because he's faithful and he's righteous, just like the psalmist. When you sing, you must have in your mind the fact that God is good, faithful, righteous, and sing with that. That's why our songs carry that theme always. The wonderful mighty acts, that God is faithful, God is righteous, that God is good, we sing about that all the time, all the time. The psalmist says, I'm going to play my instruments and I'm going to sing, I'm going to beat on the drum, I'm going to play my guitar, I'm going to play the keyboard, I'm going to take the microphone and sing my heart out because you are righteous and you're faithful, O oh God. There is none like you. And you can do it in your own home as you worship God. Remember, thank him because he's always right. You may be wrong sometimes. The best people in the world may be wrong, but he's always right. Thank him because he's always faithful. He'll never let you down. Remember that song, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There's no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, forever thou wilt be. Great is your faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, I, new mercies I see. All I have needed, your hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. May that be our song and that be our worship. As we worship, these three, two themes must go over our head. The faithfulness of God and the righteousness of God. Let's worship God. Let's all stand together and worship and praise God. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for you are faithful and you are righteous. Oh, thank you, Father, just like David. Oh, we will praise you with everything that we've got, with our mouth, with our hands, with our instruments, with our music, with our singing. In every way and every way possible, we'll praise you and worship you, oh God. Worship you because you are faithful. Great is your faithfulness, O God. New mercies are new every morning. Oh, every day you are faithful. Every day you have new mercies for us. Every day the challenges are new. Therefore, your mercies are new. 
every day every day thank you father thank you for you are always right never wrong never wrong if we have ever thought of how can god do this forgive us oh god help us to understand this great thing that you are always right you can never be wrong because you are righteous god you are a righteous god oh god and we will sing about your righteousness we will sing about how right you are how without any fault you are that no one can fault you for anything no one no one can ever call you evil and bad you have never done an evil thing and you will never do an evil thing so we completely trust our lives in our in your hands oh god we completely give our lives in your to do your will to go where you send us to be what you want us to be to do what you call us to do we completely give ourselves into your hands thank you father thank you lord we completely trust in you totally trust in you because you are faithful and you are righteous you are righteous whatever you do with our life will be right will be just will be good oh we thank you father thank you lord thank you father let our hearts praise you because you are that kind of god may our lips sing your praises declare your wonderful works oh god oh thank you father thank you jesus thank you lord bless the people today bless those that are joining us from their homes and bless the, those that are here oh may this may this thing be never forgotten we bless the older people uh, uh, from everywhere that have joined us very specially today let them know lord that we are praying for them that that they are they are in our remembrance and that you are so gracious to them that you will never forsake them you will always uphold them to the very end we thank you father may the older people very specially recognize the fact that you are always right and you are always faithful you will be faithful to the end starting from the day we were formed in our mother's womb till the very end in this life you are with us and even beyond throughout all eternity you will never leave us and never forsake us we thank you for your grace in jesus name we pray amen god bless you